All right, my guest today is Taurus Richardson, founder and CEO of IMB Partners, a private equity firm focused on acquiring and growing companies in the government contracting and utility services sectors. Taurus has over 25 years of private equity experience and has invested more than 500 million across 20 platform and add-on acquisitions. Today, we're gonna cover entrepreneurship, why they focus on minority business enterprises, contrarian thinking around GovCon and utility services. So there's a lot we're gonna go through today, but first I'll just turn it over to you, Taurus. I'd love to hear, you know, what is the high level about IMB, some of the facts and figures, how many portfolio companies, when did you start, how many people do you have? Just love to kind of get the, the overview. First, Jordan, thank you very much for having me. IMB has been around since 2010. Uh, we focus on you know, electric utilities and government contractors. We think there's a lot of customer concentration. There's a lot of founder-owned businesses in that space. And there's a way to buy really stable, great businesses at great values and create a lot of you know, sort of alpha for investors over time. Uh, today, we have six investment professionals. We're based out of Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and, you know, we're in the business of building, you know, larger companies that started out as founder owned and want to professionalize through private equity. Got it. Well, before we go into GovCon, you know, electric and utility services and just kind of diving deep into a sector, which I think a lot of people steer away from because they don't understand it, or maybe it's not the level you do. I'd love to rewind and actually let's just talk about entrepreneurship. I, I think I read something that you're like a shareholder in your dad's popcorn business at eight years old or something, but um, maybe I'm remembering this incorrectly, but I'd love just to know where does this entrepreneurial part of your DNA come from? Yeah, no. So I'm first generation in college, but second generation entrepreneur. And my dad was a Vietnam vet, came out having read Think and Grow Rich, uh, you know, self-help book. And he had a dream to open a business. And instead of opening it, he actually bought a business. So he spent a year apprenticing with a bar owner in Chicago. He talked to like five to 10 bars. And he bought a bar in 1978, of which he made me, my brother, which were 10 and seven respectively. And my mom and he were all shareholders of it. You know, that was our first foray into entrepreneurship. Uh, the business still exists. We still are open today, some 40 plus years later. My dad then went and wanted to buy a popcorn business. So we bought a, bought a popcorn business with one Let's store. Let's rewind back to the bar business. Wait a second. There's like, <laughs> you just glossed yeah. over a seven-year-old being a shareholder at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what was it like actually buying the business? Was it family capital or like where, can you just talk about, you know, actually getting the deal done? So like I say, thinking grow rich success through a positive attitude were two self-help books that my dad made all of us read. And one of them says, you know, using other people's money, which is really the private equity business. And so he wanted to buy the bar. It cost $120,000 in 1978. And basically he went to a bank, got an 80% loan, and then he went around to all of his friends and some family raising money in, you know, $50 to, you know, a couple thousand dollar increments. And he had like 36, 37 investors. And, you know, come closing, which was in November of 78, he was short, like $4,000. And so he went to the bank and he got my mom, my grandma, my both my grandmas, my brother and I, we all dressed up and we went to this bank loan meeting. He begged them to give him an extra $4,000 on top of the $84,000 they were going to give him. And they looked at him and said, it looks like you're focused. It looks like you got your whole family in it. If you're in it that way, we're in it. And so we basically, you know, I learned how to go to bank meetings. I learned how important family was to any business like this. And we wind up paying the bank back in our first three to five years. And again, the business is around 40 years later. So your dad just gets the entire family says, we're going to a bank meeting and we're not leaving until we have this loan. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's at the end of the day, people got to believe you and believe that you're going to give them the money back. And no matter what, he showed them that he was sincere and that, you know, we were all in. And that's what you want from you know, any, whenever I make an investment, I want to make sure that other people are all in. And that's what he demonstrated. And he taught us how to do. Got it. All right. Popcorn story. I got to learn about this. 
Yeah. Same thing. He, um, you know, my mom wanted a daytime business. Obviously the bar business was a nighttime business. And so we looked around for businesses and there was a guy selling 31 flavors of popcorn the way you would know 31 flavors of ice cream. So we bought a guy out uh, of a business called Really Poppin'. In 1983, I worked nights and weekends and I wind up basically, you know, selling popcorn for my locker. And, you know, by the time I got to college, my dad wanted to expand. And, you know, you can grow your way into failure. And ultimately he went from one store to three stores and a million dollars of revenue. And then he tried to go to seven and he opened in like smaller locations that didn't have foot traffic. And ultimately we, we grew that business into failure and it, it failed. And so, you know, again, I learned a lot of lessons on what you can do, learned lessons on raising capital, how you treat people, how you treat partners, but also very, very sensitive to, you know, too slow a growth or too much growth can sometimes hurt or trick, make a business a, get in a precarious position. Got it. All right. Okay. So, I mean, you, you were, you got, you grew up in Chicago in the seventies in a super entrepreneurial family, riding the ups and the downs of, of entrepreneurship. Um, but I mean, what was it like in, what was it like in the seventies in Chicago? Sure. Well, first of all, I love Chicago. You know, at the end of the day, man, we were in the middle of sort of a lot of racial tension, no different than we are today. So the examples are when I was, when we went to the, bought the bar, I li we lived on top of it. And the school district that I was in basically was going through mandatory busing. So I got bused to a town nearby that was an all white school that was being integrated. And so for me, I experienced parents and students and then adults throwing eggs and rocks at the bus and yelling, you know, the N word to us as we got off the bus. And it was just because we were different. And so on the outside, it was sort of a lot of pressure and noise. But on the inside, you know, you realize that kids are kids. And if you play and you study and you work, you can find people you like. And ultimately, I realized that there's always going to be a tribe of people that want and believe in diversity and inclusion. And there's going to be people that don't. And for me, how I live my life and how I try to spend my time is finding that tribe of people that believe in diversity and inclusion. That's really interesting. And now it's making sense when we like looking at your bio, you see this consistent theme, whether it's with, you know, that story or your focus now on IMB um, or the organization that you started with CUP. But yes, I, I definitely want to dig into this, but let's maybe kind of continue chronologically. And what was kind of the next step? You went to college at Purdue and let's just kind of start from there. I was in a hurry. I wanted to be a millionaire by 21 in high school. Um, so I graduated from high school in three years. I went to Purdue and I left Purdue to go start this popcorn business in 1987. And two things really happened. One was in May, I walked in on my house being robbed and someone shot at me and tried to kill me. And you know, I put my hands up and said, please don't shoot. And they wind up exiting the house and uh, at the end of the day, I thought I saw my life flash before me because it was so near and present. And so I came away thinking that, you know, quite frankly, the Lord, the Lord had sort of spared me for a higher purpose. I had something to do. And then like weeks later, there was an article in Jet Magazine um, in Ebony on Reginald Lewis. And it was basically 90 to 1, this article about a black man named Reginald Lewis buying a business called McCall Business Patterns and basically selling it few years later, making $63 million off of a $1 million investment. And it wasn't just the money he made, but it talked about the philanthropy and the community stuff he did. And so I looked at my mom and said, this looks like a great job. And so I started uh, from that day thinking that it was possible for me to amass a lot of money to build businesses and to be a philanthropist in a way that helped the communities that I cared most about. So I wound up going back to school dropped the popcorn startup. At school, I ran for student body president, was the president, and I met and loved lots of people. But I had this dream of going to Wall Street. Um, so I went to Solomon Brothers in the merger and acquisition group. I had a great two-year analyst program. And then at the end of it, I all of my peers in the analyst program were going to Sydney or Hong Kong to do a third year before going to business school. And there was no natural program to go to Africa. 
And so me and another analyst basically did an independent search where we called roughly a hundred people and said, if you were us, what would you do? And all of them said, you can work at this investment firm, you can work at this consulting firm. And long story short, we found a job in Africa working for initially a consulting firm that then spun out into an investment firm that we started. Wow. So there are a lot of ways we can go with this. One thing I'm just kind of thinking about is that I kind of see as a recurring theme from our conversation, what I know about you, just this like this continual curiosity of like, how does this work? Oh, okay. I don't really know, but I'm just going to go ask, you know, 50, hundred people and asking for advice. Like, what would you do if you were me? And that led to, for example, going to Africa and co-founding the investment bank in Ghana. We'll probably dive deeper into that. So let's let's keep on going. So investment bank. Just, just to that point, <laughs> right. my entire sourcing strategy for what we do today is based on that. And what I mean by it is um, you got to be comfortable cold calling people. And then you got to be comfortable asking people, if, do you have one or two other people I should talk to? Or what would you do if you were me? And that's called field research. That's trying to get into the minds of other people who've been there 20, 30 years and use their knowledge to make your road a little more efficient. So almost in everything I do from sourcing deals to hiring people to finding jobs, it starts with how do you find people that have been successful? Ask them what they would do, ask them to give you two other names. And then from that tree, over the course of 30 to 60 days, you can get reps and have talked to enough people to where you have more and more knowledge relatively quickly in the process. So along that same vein, how have you kind of taken, what is the principle here? Is it find one or two nodes and go down that, or is it go really wide and then kind of do that over the course of three, six, 12 months? And I, I'm, I'm thinking about this also in the context of transitioning veterans, because I work with a lot and have done so over the past four years, helping over 200 guys get jobs. And it's, it's kind of making me think about this question, of what is the better strategy? Is it, don't worry about looking at five different sectors, 10 different jobs, DMing on LinkedIn, 100 different people, find a handful of super connectors who are generally in an industry that you like and just follow that path. But I'm just kind of curious whether it's your relationship building, how you source, how you think about building your, your knowledge set, kind of what approach you've taken. Yeah, I mean, so I come from, again, first generation. My parents have never had professional jobs. And so and I didn't have a network in my local community around professional jobs. So the advice she always gave us was to aim for the sun and you'll at least hit the stars. And so my advice to myself and to the people that I talk to and work with is simply try to come up with a big, hairy, audacious goal or something that really motivates you that you think could be amazing to you. And by picking that one thing, it enables you to be way more focused in who you talk to, what opportunities you pursue and you know, your access points to how to get into that business, into that relationship, into whatever it is you want to do. So I'm a big believer in dream big and then narrowly focus, and it makes it much easier. So even in our business, we know that there's lots of companies in the world, but we're focused on electric and gas utilities, but focused on government services. We like concentrated businesses because no one likes them, or we like a lot of sort of call it complex um, sort of contract. Investors avoid that because they don't get it. And if we can take the time to understand the people that have made tons of money doing it, and we can become experts in that, we think there's a way to get above market returns. And so we, we think going deep in one thing is, is probably the easiest way to be safe because there are fewer people doing it. You gotta think differently than other people if you're gonna have different returns. Do you think that there is a connection between the thick skin that you had to develop growing up in what you're mentioning in 
you know, segregated area and being bust, that thick skin and how it relates now to independent thinking and contrarian thinking, or am I drawing something that's not there? When I go out, people don't immediately invite me into the room. And so I have to start by saying, where's the side door? Or how do I get in in a different way? And so you can call that contrarian, or you could just say, I got to find a different way to get to certain things because these are the assets and tools I've been given. And I'm not going to blame anybody for the lot I got. I'm going to simply use basically the starting point knowledge that if it's 100 people at the front door, why don't I go to the side door? When I went to HBS to recruit for private equity, it was maybe 60 companies that recruited for private equity at HBS. I went to Columbia Business School. They were launching their first private equity conference. I was the only Harvard uh, student at the conference. I talked to 12 people. I got two job offers because it showed out of the box thinking I was different relative to the other Columbia you know, students. Whereas if I had stayed at Harvard, I would have been one of you know, 800 people trying to get 60 jobs. Wait, you went to Columbia's private equity recruiting event? For, for, for recruiting, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, that's interesting. And just the importance of being different and embracing that and how it's actually a huge differentiator. Okay, we're going to, we'll continue with that one. Um, well, let's go, let's go back to kind of drawing the connection between you know, investment banking co-founder in Ghana to, to what was the next step? In Ghana, it was sort of, um, I wanted a year, a unique experience. And this guy basically said, what is an investment banking? How do you make money? And this was the head of the Wagyu Touche West Africa's office. And, you know, we had been two-year analysts, both me and my friend, Coach Mills. And we basically got licensed to trade in the Ghana Stock Exchange when they were about to take private a large gold company that was owned by the government. The only distinguishing factor we had was we were young, hungry, and aggressive. And we wind up working until 12 o'clock at night when others shut off at five because it was Ghana and, and that was the culture. And it turns out the fax lines basically were where the phone lines were free between eight to 12. And so we were able to fax more completed transactions to where we had 90% market share in one particular trade. And we made $4 million in less than 12 months. And for us, it taught us that being hungry, being aggressive was a trait. And thinking differently and doing things differently than everybody else, again, always pays dividends if you, you focus and you work hard enough. Uh, I left there basically to go to business school at Harvard with this simple belief that I wanted to be in my own business three years out of business school. And it was either going to be in Africa, where there's a lot of opportunity, or I wanted to do something in the U.S. in these underserved markets where you could have race, you can have, you know, communities that are, you know, sort of that have less gifts and talents and skills. And if you can build businesses there, you can create, you know, wealth and income in those communities. And that mattered to me because it was important to my childhood. Um, so I went to Harvard Business School thinking I was going to private equity. I went there thinking I would apprentice for two years, similar to my dad, who apprenticed for a year before buying his first business. And two years into, you know, so after graduating from Harvard, I went to a firm called Joseph Little, John and Levy. It was like a, you know, call it a billion plus private equity firm. And the criteria I had was I want to work for people who had made $100 million or more self-made. And the three principals there had done that. And the theory was in apprenticeship, I didn't only want to learn how to be a good investor, I wanted to learn how to be a good individual. And so I watched them in the personal lives, I watched them in the community life, I watched how they you know, invested in the trade and the ecosystem of private equity. And all of that helped to form the professional I am today. Roll forward two years from there, Michael Porter from Harvard Business School wanted to start an inner city venture fund. It matched up with my dreams and my goals. I was the first employee hired. Uh, we wind up picking up another gentleman named Willie Woods as the president and the senior partner to me in that firm. And we were able to raise 130 and then $300 million in the 2000s. 
we generated 20% returns, we created a thousand jobs for people of color in urban communities. And it was just a great place to learn and to be trained on how to invest with you know, founders and entrepreneurs, but also to have a little bit of impact along the way. Is that kind of like the first um, time that you really had a chance to really invest in or starting this thesis of investing in uh, minority business enterprises and just getting exposure to a wide array of, of businesses? Yeah, it's funny. Like, so um, originally it was about inner city and urban. And my partner, Willie, and I wanted it to be focused on minority as well. And what I learned then and what is true today is that the minority thing is tricky, right? There's a discount if you buy a minority business uh, because people worry that on exit, you can't get out of the same valuation. Um, the minority entrepreneurs maybe have less exposure to private equity, so they don't understand the, the, the partnership aspect of it. And so for 20 years, I've tried to navigate how to do successful investing in diverse and minority-owned businesses. And that was my first foray into it. And over the years, we've learned how to narrow slice it to the point where you know, three of the first five investments we've made at IMB have been with women or minority investors. And, you know, we've generated, you know, 40 plus percent returns. What was it like kind of starting IMB? And I think you were mentioning it was around 2010. And, you know, what was IMB Solutions like in the very beginning? And, you know, what was that chapter? And then just the next chapter? I started out in 2010, we hadn't really succeeded at ICV in investing in minority businesses. We had become really good at investing in lower middle market businesses and, and found our own businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I actually started to write a book called Big, Get Big or Grow, Go Home because I believe that if minority businesses to survive, if woman owned business, if urban businesses are to survive, they have to get to scale. And then, you know, after I wrote the book, I realized you got to go out and promote it. And I just felt like rather than talking about it, I wanted to be about it. And so I wind up taking a couple consulting projects with firms that could, like Ernst & Young, who could explain their supply chain, explain why it's hard to hire smaller businesses, whether they're diverse or not. A uh, foundation paid to do research on a couple companies that have done very well. And so between learning the best practices of what was working and understanding the corporation's pain points, I realized that you know, one size doesn't fit all and every person that has a minority business goal in terms of a corporation is not so easy to win in every category. And so by the time we got to 2014, we had narrowed the strategy to where we thought we were like, you know, catching goldfish, right? Like in, in government services, in utility sector, there's concentrated businesses, there's founder-owned businesses, there's when it's your back in terms of growth, there's market, you know, sort of recession downside protection, which we now learn to say, you know, these are, you know, you know, pandemic resistant businesses, right? We didn't know that at the time. Um, and so we figured out how to be in this little niche space where we can buy businesses at three, four, five times versus a market that's paying seven to 10 times. And so, I mean, it just sounds like that was, or this is like the culmination of, you know, major factors in your life with entrepreneurship, the passion and focus on uh, MBE, as well as your experience in private equity. And it's just kind of all coming together. It, you know, it's almost like this is the, we're about the scaling. Like we, we took the time to understand the pressure points, to understand the exit issues, to understand the capital structure issues. And so now we've done it enough times to where it's like Raymond, you know, when the guy said there's lots of them, there's lots of high cars, there's lots of businesses that are about to transition because founders are getting old. There's an ability to buy a, non-minority-owned business converted into a minority-owned business, have existing quals and a proven track record, apply capital and 
you know, best practices in hiring and to really build businesses that can be more valuable and can be converted into minority if it makes sense or simply just be a better business to that, to that company. And so for us, I feel like, you know, we bought five businesses in the last six or seven years. We're going to buy 50 in the next 10 just because we now have the technique down and we're ready to scale. Can you talk a little bit more about that utility services and GovCon focus just because, you know, when you look at investment theses in the vast majority of private equity firms, like one of the things they don't really do is, you know, they might say real estate and government contracting or things that have that. So, I mean, how, how have you developed that expertise around that so that you can focus on it? Great place to deploy capital relative to other industries that you could be pursuing. I mean, like think about private equity in the 90s and 2000s. You know, people proudly said we don't do technology. That generally is, doesn't make sense. But at the end of the day, people don't do what they don't understand because they think they can get in trouble. And so, fine. But when I look at utilities and you see these contractors and construction firms that have five-year, 10-year contracts, 30 years of doing business with someone, every owner is worth 50 to $100 million or better. You're like, well, why doesn't private equity focus on this more? And it's basically they don't understand. And it, the, the entrepreneurs are... You know, mostly a lot of them didn't go to prestigious colleges and prestigious graduate schools. They are bottom up. And so for me, I have more in common with those people with hard work and, you know, coming up from the bootstraps than half of the people in private equity, if not more. And so when I talk to those founders, there's kinship and relationship based on the struggle, based on the way we figured out how to build businesses without having a lot to start with. And as you learn that these customers really must have the construction, that the utilities must build their grid, that you know, we all now know that you gotta cut the tree lines because of all the issues in California, but like veg management is a category that's gonna be here for years. It's recession resistant, you know, utilities needed, retail needs it, commercial needs it, et cetera. Um, these are places where if you take the time to understand it, you'll see the recurring nature of the cash flow. And you'll realize that these are great sectors. Uh, they happen to come with customer concentration. People don't like that. Business school teaches you diversification of revenue. Uh, the truth is that that is a good thing, but it's price terms and structure. At the right price, I'd pay more for a customer concentrated or less for a customer concentrated business with a sticky long-term 30, 50 year relationship with one customer. To me, I sleep very easy at that. And I know that through M&A, I can diversify out over years and I'll create a more valuable business because more buyers will be attracted to it when we check off the box of diverse, diversified business. Interesting, just because, especially the, one of the earlier points you made, is just people don't do what they don't understand. And it's that heuristic of, or it's these heuristics of education, career, or industries, and these general industries have these characteristics check, check, check. Okay. I'm going to go focus on that, but that's where the crowd is. And that goes to your earlier point of the side door. And that's where the alpha is. That's where the opportunity is, where it's that next level of understanding, which the majority of people won't go into. And so once you had developed that expertise, then you have that filter. So then you can go look at all these other industries or sub industries that allow you to use that filter and say, this is a good opportunity. I understand it better than others. And therefore we're going to find uh, deals here that are good for us. Yeah, hundred percent right. And the truth of it is that what I learned in Ghana in particular was no matter what market you're in, 10 to 20% are going to succeed hmm. uh, because they got to service the other people. And so all of these industries exist for a reason. We got to have lights. We got to have government services. I'm in Bethesda, you know, U.S. government is the largest customer in the world. You mean to tell me we can't figure out how to become a good capital provider and partner to transitioning founders who want to get out of businesses that they've been working on for many years with a great customer? Um, and so with that basic, like, that can't be true, that there's not great assets here that you would be comfortable financing. Uh, we just started hunting and we realized you got to get more people that have worked in government services, talk to more people to figure out 
how you do the you know bid recapture work, et cetera, et cetera. And at some point you become just sort of better, faster, and more efficient than people that haven't put in the time. So to your early point, the deep focus makes us become way more laser focused on what's good and bad and the focus on where we can make money. You know, what do you think makes the firm different? Like at the end of the day, love of the game is everything. We don't have to be the best private equity firm, but we love what we do and we believe in partnership and people. And so the entrepreneurs that we come across, we are trying to make sure they like us and we like them. We're looking for tribe, whether it be because they believe in diversity and inclusion, they believe in entrepreneurship, they believe in bottom-up strategy of just working hard and being successful. We want people that want to do that with us. And at the end of the day, it's so many goldfish out there. We don't have to be the best. We just have to be great at what we do and finding people that want to do it with us. That's step one. Um, you know, you have a book behind you called Traction. And yeah, one of my, um, so actually one of my buddies, uh, uh, Michael Curry, who's a uh, CEO of Apex Physics Partners, who's a successful search funder. Uh, he and his partner successfully acquired a business, successfully, you know, they just got recapped by Blue Sea Capital, which is publicly announced. And he said, you have to read this. Because I was like, our business is growing so fast. And I just felt like our systems are starting to break. He's like, you have to read Traction. And then let's talk. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he's right. I'm happy that you have the book and that you're investing in it. For us, you know, both the fund, IMB, and all five of our books partner companies use it. Um, at the end of the day, it's a leadership tool, it's a vision and strategy tool, and it's an organization execution tool. Um, and underneath it all, it empowers people to not be managed, but to give them the freedom to figure out how to execute the goals and things that they want to do. And so we couldn't be bigger believers in the book. We've been using it now for two years, and the system is if you want to scale to 50 companies from five, you got to figure out how to create these repeatable processes that enable you to do more with, with less time. Can, can you talk about the team a little more? And, and you said, it, was it five or six people? Or how so many? Six, six investment professionals. And, you know, um, my, my most treasured partnership is with a gentleman named Calvin Pennington, who I've known for 31 years. He started out as a mentor. He was 10 years out of Purdue, coming back for a fraternity homecoming event. I had recently left Prudential and the leveraged buyout business to start a private equity firm. And he basically became my you know, mentor and counselor on how to get a job at Solomon Brothers, what to do over in Africa, how to come back to business school, how to focus on private equity, what to do with ICB, how to structure deals. And to the point where in 2010, when we started, I got eight people to give me some seed capital, almost like a pledge fund. And he was one of those investors. He became sort of a investment advisor, sort of CIO to me, where on any deal I would screen, he would sort of review it with me to just make sure I wasn't missing stuff. Um, and then he became a full-time partner believing in what we're doing so much in the last 12 or 24 months. And um, it's just a very treasured relationship. He's a great investor and a great thought partner with me as we execute the vision. Uh, underneath him or around him, I have a lady named Farrah Holder, who I've known since you know early 2000s, who's done business development and sourcing in a way that, again, in utilities and GovCon, we're making sure we see everything we're supposed to see. And more importantly, she's conveying the tone and the temperament of our firm mm -hmm. in a way that helps us to see not just the deal, but also the partner to understand what we'd like if we were to be business. Well, let's talk a little bit more about partner because I noticed that on your website, that was like the first thing you say on what you value. And I think I think probably every private equity firm says we have we value partnership. So it's less about the headline, it's more about the story behind the headline. And so I'm curious, like, is there an example to, like from the portfolio, like this is what it means by partnership? Yeah, so I think of it as, um, I want people to treat me the way, uh, you know, for, for them to treat me the way I treat them and I treat them the way they want me to treat them, right? And, a couple examples, man, like in two situations, um, in, the, in Mike Lafada's case at LCS, 
the day we signed an LOI to buy his business or to invest in his business, he left the dinner and he checked into a hospital for 30 days for uh, leukemia. You know, his name was on the door. It was very important to him. And what I said to him was like, we are going to be here for you. We will manage the business for you, free it for you, but we will figure this out with you. And so we stood by him during the 30 days. We bought the business when he was going through recovery. His first six months out the gate were different than most. And we took a more hands-on approach to managing that business while he was going through his recovery. He's now fully recovered. He's back to being the day-to-day CEO in a way that's great. But at the end of the day, we had agreed to do something together. We agreed to stand with him when he had a problem. And I've had that situation twice where another CEO you know, had some health issues and we basically took over running a business for 18 months while he recovered, thankfully. And, you know, the wife and, and he are now investors and your friends, but basically we treated it as if he was family. And that's what we get. Like we don't have this belief that cutting heads is the way to create wealth or treating people by telling them what you, telling them what to do is right. Like, They've been doing something for a long time. It's working. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bought it or invested in it. And my job is to figure out how to make sure we hear each other and that we can figure out a way to, to be successful together. So, again, I, you don't have to be in, in the world of partnership and people first. It's a tribe. You just have to find people that believe that. And that's the secret sauce versus trying to be the only one that does it. I love that. And, it's, and it goes back to trust and taking the long view of relationships as opposed to a short-term transactional view. Let's can you, maybe we can shift gears a little bit. And I was looking at your bio and I saw uh, Council of Urban Professionals and just curious, like, what's the, what's the story on that? Cause I, you know, love to hear about the impact people are having on their communities. Yeah. So, you know, it's a short and a long story, but the short one or the, the medium story would be, <laughs> I got to private equity before the word emerging managers existed and how people of color, women, and or even early stage funds could get in the business. And at 28, I was raising my first fund, right? I always believe that I want to make sure that the path behind me is easier than it was for me so that we put lights up so people know where to go. And so starting in the early 2000s, we helped to start something called the Emerging Management Plan Sponsor Conference that brought together LPs and fund managers uh, and or fund professionals who wanted to learn more about private equity and to get into the space. Roll forward, that business continues to be around. It was sold to Groves not, not long ago and Renee Griffin is there. In addition, we basically from the, that start, we moved to something called a Council of Urban Professionals where the view was how do you focus on 25 to 40 year old professionals who were early in their career, high performing, but give them sort of the ability to network across industries and with more senior and junior professionals in their own verticals in a way where together we're better, where we can ask and offer help and we can help to both highlight and sh- provide shine for those professionals but also you know, give them resources and mentorship. Over the years, we've probably touched about five to 7,000 people a year. We've run 50 or so events a year. And you know, today, the organization of CUP started in 2007. We were sort of 15 years into it or 14 years into it. And now all of those people are heads of firms, heads of their business units, heads of their groups. And it just makes it much easier for the people underneath them. And it made it easier for them to be seen and, and be successful. It's a, it's a tremendous honor to have been a part of creating that. Um, and the fact that, you know, it's going strong. It has lots of corporate support in the middle of this time where race and, you know, sort of what corporations are doing is a topic. It's a relevant organization that helps these companies navigate diversity, inclusion, and equity issues. How have you thought throughout your life of balancing career and impact? And I, and I, I don't know if this is an inaccurate generalization, but I feel like a lot of people are like, all right, I'm going to make my monies in my 30s and 40s, and then I'm going to give. 
and then I'm going to go to charity or I'll be a philanthropist or then I'll volunteer when I have everything set. But I know, and I'm, I'm asking this because I'm struggling with it also, where I spend a lot of time with transitioning veterans. It is my passion for the past four years. And there's this tension between focusing on the business, growing the company and impact that I want to have. And I, I've just been wrestling with that because I don't want to wait for another five or 10 years and then I'm going to give back. So I didn't know kind of how you have uh, thought through that or even, you know, had to balance and wrestle with that. I think that's a great question. I mean, you know, I think I've overbalanced or over tilted to impact work at times in my career and it's hurt me to some degree, but the, the short answer is I originally had this view that I want to give 10% of my time and 10% of my money annually to one or two things that mattered. So I never wanted to be broad on five different boards of this and that. I wanted to, you know, most of the stuff I've done, I've founded and started things that I thought there was a void where I could have, you know, something that might contribute to making it better. So I probably started 10 or more organizations and president of 15, 20 nonprofits. But the one thing that, that sort of is in the middle of that is one, it can have a problem with your career, right? I got involved in politics. I hit a, um, a situation where I ran into an investor who didn't like the politics that we were advocating for legislation and it hurt me in my career. And so, you know, I got knocked down from it. So the political stuff and just the activity, you got to keep it into a, 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 a world where you realize you're still a professional, not just an advocate. So you have to balance that one thing learned. And the other is just family. Um, as my kids, you know, grew up, you know, when you already a working demanding job and then you try to give your time to nonprofit or impact work, something is being sacrificed and it's usually time at home or time spent with your kids. And so by the time my kids were seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I realized that I wasn't putting in the work at home. And so uh, I've been fortunate to basically recalibrate and you know, spend more time at home over the last 10 years. And it was, it's been a tremendously important thing to me. And so as they leave home, I'll have a little bit more disposable time. I'll rotate, rotate back to a little bit more impact work. But I think making sure you have time for your family is important. That's, that's incredibly uh, powerful to hear just because it makes me think back and I think it was November, December, 2018, when my wife frustrated, Jing's all like, you care more about veterans than you do about me and the family. Yeah. And I was just like gone in startup land, you know, doing two business, a nonprofit and the business all at once. And this is with Debt Maven, the first business, and then Elite Meet, the nonprofit that we co-founded. And I just realized even now when we have a one-year-old and a four-year-old, we're now past the stage when it's no longer about survival, <laughs> like it was for the first four of the five years of entrepreneurship. And now it's about growth, but it's just a different set of demands on time. And fortunately now, Jing quit her job as a lawyer and is with us full time. So she and I could be together, but whether it's from 6.30 in the morning till 8.15, am I with my kids? Or am I like partly doing emails, partly thinking about the day or in the evening when they come in, am I at the playground and I'm on my phone? Right. It's this constant tension between these parts of your life because I feel like I'm a better entrepreneur when I'm also giving back. But when I'm giving back and focus on the business, then I'm not as good at, as a father. I think Jing and I spend a lot of time together. We love working together. But now it's like, how do I make sure that, you know, I'm putting in what I call like an Ironman effort to being a father. Yeah. So we're, we're training for our triathlons now. I'm, I'm signed up for November 6th in Florida to do an Ironman. And as I was putting in, you put in tons of hours. And then it just made me think like, am I putting in an Ironman effort into being a dad? But what does that actually mean? Like, is it the quantity is it the quality and how do you actually balance that? Well, the good news, man, is you get a lifetime to hopefully be the dad, right? So uh, while there's no do-overs, there's 
you know, just like when you have a kid, you know, from one month to the next, they change when they're younger, from one quarter to the next, they change when they're a little older. There's many ways for you to show up. And it's most important that you, you figure that out over time. But there's no, unlike a marathon, there's no end point, you know, uh, or it's a, it's a marathon of a lifetime. And so you have lots of ways to- It's multiple it. ultra marathons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And sometimes they need, to, they need the space for you to leave them alone and for them to gain their independence. And so uh, parenting and, and that balance is probably the most complicated thing we all will do, um, but it's really rewarding. And it just, it requires time on task as well. What would you say would be the advice you would give to the 22 year old version of yourself? Um, swing hard early, right? You have, um, you have no downside in terms of, you know, obligations and, you know, you have nothing but curiosity. If you go deep on anything from the time you're, I would say even early, 18 to 27, you have nothing but time to focus on whatever it is you think you're most passionate or interested in and do not do all of this sort of staging to, to prepare yourself for the moment when you're fully ready. Uh, so there was a statement at Purdue called go ugly early. Uh, go entrepreneur early is probably what I would say and, and find your passion. And, and even if it's inside of a company, be focused on your passion and it'll be. I've never seen anybody that knocks on my door and says, I wanna do this at 20 or 22, who ultimately doesn't do it. And so that, that picking something that you think can give you the passion is probably the secret sauce for people's success right. over time. How have you thought about uh, entrepreneurship? Because, you know, in the first year or two, uh, really the first 12 months of entrepreneurship back in 2016, I'm like, this is sexy. This is awesome. Like CEO and title. Yeah. And I'm like, just getting started. And then you just get hit in the face for four more years. <laughs> and you realize entrepreneurship is not sexy. And every time I talk about this with people who are into it, they're like, no, that lasts for like six to 12 months. But I'm just wondering, like, what do you think makes you an entrepreneur by heart? And, you know, why are you an entrepreneur as opposed to, I'll just go to a $3 billion private equity firm and I would do very well. And you know what, I'd have a probably maybe a little balance in the life and everything else. Like what makes you an entrepreneur? I think the, um, I think for me, man, like I actually don't love like doing what everybody else is doing. Right, like that's just not that interesting to me. So I really do, and I don't have this great need for other people's approval. So if I don't make the most money, if I don't, you know, again, get to be the VIP ticket holder because I'm doing something that's not as sexy as someone else, so what? I fundamentally believe that you put me in any room, any circle, I will find a way out and I can figure out how to fend for myself and the people that I care about, right? And so that blind faith that I can figure it out helps me to, again, I've started just a lot of things with just one desk or a blank sheet of paper. And it's not about the entrepreneurship. It's about, I know I can recruit people. I know I can raise the capital. I know we generally will buy something that will you know, accelerate whatever it is, the dream or the path we're doing. And so I think it's the blind faith that we'll figure it out and, and or pivot. And the other is just that you, you got to love it. Like I, what we're doing in IMB right now is probably move slower because to, to your point, entrepreneurship is not a straight line. And it's moved slower because hiring the right people and, you know, getting the infrastructure in place just took longer. But the flip side of it is, yes, I probably left money on the table by not going to another large private equity firm versus starting this business. But we have ability, my dream is to create three milestones every year that will be here 20 years from now that I'll be proud of. And between the partners and the businesses we're buying and the business we're creating, I just feel like I'm going to be more at peace and, and satisfied with the talents I was given. Did I do them for productive use and for the impact that I see? 
by having the free terrain of being an entrepreneur to see that vision to fruition. It's not often in these conversations that you hear people use the words, my dream is. And it's just, it's refreshing to hear that. And I just really appreciate, you know, everything that you've shared today. 